So I have titled the message uh, this morning, War and Peace. And we are going to uh, look at it from different angles. And I wish we could have had a discussion time after this uh, message because I'm sure a lot of questions would come into your mind. I would encourage you to write those questions down and the cell group is a very good place where you could pick this up and discuss it and uh, whatever doubts there are, hopefully you can get it clear. Point number one in your notes, I like to call it the prelude. The prelude. And I'm going to read to you an amazing portion of scripture and it's almost unbelievable. Look at what the word of God says in Revelation 12, 7 to 9. And intentionally I have underlined the first part. Then there was war in heaven. I want you to press the pause button and I want you to think that through. Then there was war in heaven. How can that be? What a profound mystery. In a perfect environment, there is war. There is war among perfect beings, angels. And just to uh, uh, set the uh, historical context of this, uh, let me keep reading. Michael, Michael by the way is the warrior angel. Gabriel is the messenger angel. So you may want to write down their warrior angel by the side of Michael. Michael and the angels under his command fought the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle and was forced out of heaven. Underline the word force. He didn't want to leave heaven. He was kicked out unceremoniously. This great dragon the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, underline the word deceive. That's the devil's major work. That's his uh, number one job description, to tell lies. He is the father of lies and he lies and lies and lies and unfortunately people believe his lies and fall victim to his deception. Deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Underline the words thrown down. Forced out of heaven and thrown down to the earth. And that's a very frightening uh, reality for you and for me because what that means is the devil is operating here on earth and he is very active and he has plenty of experience. So, when did this war happen? Again, we are not uh, explicitly told in the Bible of times and dates, but uh, there was a rebellion in a perfect environment. Lucifer, an amazing angel that God created. In fact, one preacher called him the Prime Minister of Heaven. Lucifer means son of the morning, the shining one. He was a brilliant, beautiful angel. He was decked with all the finest uh, jewels uh, that uh, you could ever imagine. And he had the gift of music. That's why today we have so much of worship wars. Because uh, the devil was, uh, Lucifer was gifted with music. And uh, it almost seems like as if though God put all his eggs into one basket when he created Lucifer. And uh, Lucifer became the rotten apple. And he rebelled against God. He wanted to take over God's throne. He led a massive rebellion and in that war, he was thrown out of heaven. So that's the prelude. War in heaven. Profound mystery. Unbelievable. But that leads us to point number two, the prohibition. The prohibition. So God created man and it was uh, uh, not too soon after he created the first family, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve that uh, murder took place in the first family. So God came up with what we know to be the Ten Commandments which is repeated twice in the scriptures. The book of Deuteronomy simply means the second law, meaning the law is repeated, right? Once in Exodus and then in Deuteronomy. And then uh, 
in the Ten Commandments, we have this explicit command, do not murder, don't kill. So what is God upholding? The sanctity of human life, meaning that life is precious and valuable, that every one of us is created in the image of God equal. Brother Clifford brought that out in his prayer very beautifully. We are all created equally in the image of God. But unfortunately, because of sin, that image of God is marred, it's diminished, and today, unfortunately, humans sit upon each other and kill, and kill brutally and violently. Life that was intended to be precious for all practical purposes has become very cheap. And you have heard that statement from people. Life is so cheap. People are being killed like cattle. So the prohibition. Now that brings us to point number three, the problem. So why is there a war in the world? Good question. And the answer is given to us in many places in the Bible. But I have intentionally picked up one that has tremendous practical ramifications for us. James chapter two, uh, 4 verses 1 and 2. And as I read this section, I want you to underline whatever word is kind of jumping out of the page for you. Okay, so keep your pen handy. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? And by the way, James is writing to Christians. Okay, so he's not addressing non-Christians. I like this modern rendering. Look at the next line. Isn't it the whole army of evil desires at war within you. So if I were you, I would underline that. The whole army of evil desires at war within you. So there is an army of evil desires in your heart and my heart. And they are waging a warfare. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it, underline the word kill. And again, keep in mind, James is writing to Christians. You are jealous. By the way, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified because of jealousy. I just read that in Acts chapter 7 as part of my reading assignment for the leadership team. He was killed out of jealousy. You are jealous for what others have and you can't possess it so you fight and you quarrel to take it away from them. And that includes war. And yet the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. I mean, how much more simplistic can it get than that? We don't have what we require because we are not going to the Lord and asking Him for it. So instead of going to the Lord, we are resorting to all kinds of human ingenuity in order to kill and to get what another guy has and make it our own. Now the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 7, a passage I have referred to many times in my sermons, Mark 7, you may just want to jot it down, Mark 7, 21 to 23. Mark 7, 21 to 23. Write it down and you can check it out later. The Lord Jesus said, for from within, from within, so it's an inside job, for from within there arise evil thoughts and murder. All those thoughts of murder originate from within the human heart which is deceitful and desperately wicked according to the prophet Jeremiah. And I've just given you one example among many examples I could have given from the word of God just to show you the reality of war that springs because out of a wicked heart that we have. So 2 Samuel chapter 3 verse 1, the war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. <laughs> and I would use one word to describe that statement, what a tragedy civil war. Here was a nation that God raised up to be a light to the rest of the world, to give knowledge of the truth to the rest of the world. But instead of dispensing truth, what were they doing? Engaged in a bitter, long civil 
war, discrediting God and causing the rest of the world not to turn to the God of the Bible. That's why I picked that verse, an example. Now, point number four, the price of war. You may also want to call it the cost or the consequences. I mean, I went to Google just to, out of curiosity, and I just, just uh, typed in uh, the cost of war, and it was unbelievable the stuff that came up. I didn't even bother reading. It was too much, too much to handle. So I'm just going to, uh, I have given, I have come up with a list. My country had a war for 25 years, a bitter, bitter civil war. So some of what I have listed here comes out of my own experience, from my own country. And the rest uh, is of course common sense, okay? Widespread death. <laughs> and within brackets you can write the innocent. Who get killed the most in a war are the innocent people. So when bombing takes place, either by air or by tanks or by ship, who suffers the most? The innocent civilians. Widespread death. The second cost of war is pestilence and famine. I mean, I visited parts of Sri Lanka where entire vegetation was all burnt up because of the war. And even to this day, the ground is all parched. Heavy duty chemicals that were used to kill vegetation and eventually people. So, pestilence and famine. And by the way, if you read the book of Revelation, and if you come to chapter 6, you have what is called the four horses of the Apocalypse. The first horse is a, a rider on a white horse, and that is Antichrist, coming with the offer of false peace. Right? He comes with a bow, but there are no arrows. So, diplomatic success. So, the first horse is peace, false peace, which doesn't last. The second horse is a fiery red horse depicting bloodshed war. The rider had a sword in his hand. So that's the second horse. The third horse is a black horse and the black horse speaks of starvation, famine, the rationing of food and uh, the fourth horse is a pale horse signifying death. That's just the introduction to the Great Tribulation period. Four horses of the Apocalypse. And uh, pestilence and famine are very, very real. Thirdly, colossal damage to infrastructure and nature. So recently uh, when Gaza was bombed, you and I saw pictures of uh, entire structures just collapsed and uh, people going to visit their literally burnt out houses and that was a very pathetic sight to behold. So, and then you have to spend billions to rebuild. And uh, number four, pollution of the environment. So we are told that the ozone layer is so severely damaged that there are so many holes in it that the ultraviolet rays can just easily penetrate and cause terrible illnesses among people. And all that is because of war and the pollution of the environment. I mean, I don't even want to go into another subject which is fascinating by itself just for research. Uh, the debris that is found in space. You know, there is so much of space uh, research being done today that whether you like it or not, there is so much of debris out there in space. And as one wise quack put it, whatever goes up has got to come down. Not immediately, but sometime later. So one fine day you are going to hear that there is going to be debris from space going to fall on Ajax. That's why prophetically I didn't choose to live in Ajax. We go in alphabetical order. The court union is down the line. Okay, so you are safe for the moment. And then number five is depression, and you may also want to write another word which I should have written, suicide. The trauma, the emotional trauma of warfare, how do you cope with it for the rest of your life? You live with it, 
you see people die before your eyes, you see your family die. How do you cope with all that emotional pain? I am dealing with families like that every time I go to visit Sri Lanka. And uh, so there is depression. I always say that those war orphans that we meet need child psychologists to help them. And unfortunately there are no child psychologists available. And leads to terrible uh, taking of life, suicide. Then uh, another uh, price of war is terrible physical injuries, paralysis, amputation of limbs, and you have seen them in wheelchairs or just consigned to a hospital bed of no practical use and what a way to live the rest of your life. Okay, the physical uh, plague of war. And then war orphans and war widows, that's a subject by itself. And how do you help people like that? Often by war, widowed by war. Thank God in a country like Canada, the government uh, gives help. But in many parts of the world, government afford, gives very little help to war orphans and war widows. And then there is the case of the disappeared. So right now in Sri Lanka there are so many uh, uh, groups that are involved in trying to locate the people who have disappeared during the war. Mothers holding photographs of children, crying openly, wailing, uh, just trying to find some information about children who have disappeared during the war. How do you live with that pain? And uh, the disappeared. Then defense budgets that have to be increased in order to defend your country. So more money is spent on defense budgets as opposed to spending it on the necessities of life. Education, hospital care, farming. And instead of money being spent for those wise causes, they are being spent for defense. Here is another price of war, the scourge of landmines. My country, there are entire areas Five years after the war, they are out of bounds because there are landmines. I still remember on one of my visits during the war, when we went into the war zone during the lull in the fighting, and I saw this very beautiful peacock. And I really wanted to get a good shot of this guy. So I started tracking this guy into the forest and suddenly one of the locals just grabbed me by the shirt and pulled me right back. And he said, where do you think you're going? I said, I want to take a good shot of that peacock. He said, it will be history. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? There are landmines there. Do you want us to send your body in a coffin back to Canada? So uh, the reality of landmines, of which you and I have no clue living in this part of the world, but a harsh reality in countries where there is uh, conflict and war. You know, one of my heroes are the people who remove landmines painstakingly, only about three landmines could be removed uh, in one given day. And uh, they had to wear all kinds of heavy equipment as they tried to unearth these landmines. And uh, from time to time, I would hear an uh, ambulance go by and I asked the locals, what's that ambulance all about? Oh, somebody has been blown up in a landmine. What a reality. And then the development of fearful weapons of war. That continues unabated to this day. Biochemical weapons, nuclear weapons, laser guided uh, missiles which can strike with pinpoint accuracy. Incredible. The kind of world that we are living in. As one uh, politician said, it, it would only take a madman to push a button of a nuclear bomb and this whole world would be destroyed 30 times over. Folks, it should cause us to sweat as we think of the kind of world that we are living in. The terrible price and cost of war. And this is only just a partial list. So much more could be added. Now, number five is the prediction. The prediction. So the Lord Jesus Christ predicted that in the end times, there is going to be a distinguishing sign. The nations and kingdoms will proclaim war against each other 
Now look at the next uh, line. But all this will only be the beginning of the horrors to come. Underline the word beginning. So all the wars that you are going to hear of. So Joel, you had an interesting statistic. 68 nations are at war right now and 500 plus conflicts in, in the world. Very intriguing statistics. Did you know that? 68 nations right now are at war. Some kind of war going on. And we only know about four or five that we could list by name. But those are only the beginning of the horrors to come. So said the Lord Jesus Christ in predictive prophecy given to us in Matthew chapter 24. One place among many other places uh, where he predicted it. And of course the war to end all wars is what? The battle of Armageddon. And that's described for us in vivid detail in the book of Revelation. When Napoleon uh, fought uh, in the valley of Megiddo, uh, he looked upon that valley and said the perfect place for a world war. And so that's how the Bible describes the place where the final war is going to take place, Valley of Megiddo, commonly called the Battle of Armageddon. But now, all this is very depressing, right? So point number six, the promise. There is a wonderful promise. There is hope at the end of the tunnel. And I'm going to read to you three sets of scriptures. I believe that I want to let the word speak for itself. So don't turn the page over because we haven't read the verse on this side yet, okay? Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4. That verse was already quoted two times this morning. So let me now make it complete by quoting it the third time. The Lord will settle international disputes. Amen. Right. Some of you want the wars to continue. All the nations, isn't that beautiful? All the nations will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. All wars will stop and military training will come to an end. Military training will come to an end. And that's the day that we are looking forward to. Now, one scripture I haven't quoted in your notes, as I was praying this morning, this verse came to my mind. You may want to write it down, Psalm 46 and verse 9. Psalm 46 and verse 9. Again, a beautiful verse that talks about the promise of the end of all war. So let me read it for you, 46, 9. God makes wars cease to the ends of the earth, he breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Isn't that beautiful? And we uh, would uh, pray and say, uh, hasten that day, O Lord. Hasten that day when these promises would become reality. And then, of course, Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. This is the promise of the new world. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I would like you to underline new heaven, new earth. Why a new earth? Because this earth as we know it is drenched with blood. 21 centuries of blood drenching earth. So a new earth has got to be created. For the old heaven and the old earth have disappeared. And the sea was also gone. So enjoy the sea while it lasts. Okay? And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. That's going to be a satellite city, the new Jerusalem. Right? Hanging in midair, and the dwellers on earth will be able to behold it in all its glory and beauty. That's the book of Revelation. That's why if you don't read Revelation, you won't get excited about anything, right? You'll only get excited about sending your roots deep down into earth here and not looking for the future realities. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be 
with them. Now contrast this with Christmas. God made a brief appearance to earth at a, uh, in a limited location called Palestine for 33 years. That's the Lord Jesus. But there is going to come a defining day when God is going to permanently live with us here on earth. And what's the consequence? Are you ready for this? Just today at our cell group I highlighted this. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. So in the new world there will be no need for tissue boxes. Right? It will go off your groceries. And there will be no more death. No more hospitals. No more needles. All the doctors and nurses will be out of a job. Right? Some of you are listening. And there will be no more death, no more cemeteries, no more funeral homes, no more times of visitation for the dead, or sorrow, or crying, or pain. Those are dreaded enemies of today. Sorrow, crying, pain. The psalmist said, my pain is ever with me. Jeremiah said, my wound is incurable. We studied all this yesterday at our cell group. All these things are gone for 10 years. Circle the word forever. You know, when you read the Bible, those words should grab you and grip you. It should grab you and grip you. So, that's the most wonderful promise you can find anywhere in the Bible. The coming new world. Now that brings us to our final point. Okay, Pastor, so where do you and I fit into all this today? So point number seven is the prevention. How can you and I prevent war today? Yes, you heard me right. How can we prevent war today? So we are going to show you a video clip going uh, back to the era of uh, Gandhi and uh, World War I. And they are going to highlight a word. With each clip, a word is going to be highlighted as to the practical application of what we could do to halt war. So we are going to let the video roll. India, 1930. Mohandas Gandhi leads thousands of non-violent protesters as part of the Salt March. When the marchers finally reach the sea, Gandhi gathers a handful of salt in open opposition to the British salt tax. The march provokes large-scale acts of civil disobedience against the British rule in India. Denmark, 1943. In protest to Nazi occupation, thousands of Danish citizens participate in clandestine activities that save over 7,000 Jews from being sent to concentration camps. Further general strikes are coordinated by an underground freedom council, and Nazi plans to expand the occupation are thwarted. United States, 1955. In Montgomery, Alabama, Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat on a city bus, and she joins other civil rights leaders to initiate a bus boycott to oppose the city's policy of racial segregation on public buses. The boycott eventually forces the Supreme Court to acknowledge that segregated buses are unconstitutional. Poland, 1980. Workers at the Gdansk shipyard go on strike and demand the right to form their own union free from communist control. The strike spreads across the city and across the country, forcing government officials to meet most of their demands. The Solidarity Movement becomes the first open trade union in communist Europe. Philippines, 1986. In protests against dictator Ferdinand Marcos, peaceful demonstrations involved over 200,000 Filipino citizens as well as several prominent political, military, and religious figures. As a result of the protests, Marcos flees and Corazon Aquino becomes president. Czechoslovakia, 1989. Nonviolent protests against the communist government expand until over 500,000 people are demonstrating in Prague. In late November, nearly all Czech citizens participate in a two-hour nationwide general strike that brings the country to a standstill. The following day, the government announces that it will relinquish power. Serbia, 2000. After election results are falsified by the ruling party, hundreds of thousands of citizens converge on Belgrade as a part of an organized general strike against dictator Slobodan Milosevic. As a result of widespread non-cooperation from citizens, police, and the military, Milosevic is forced to step down. 
Liberia, 2003. In protest against the civil war and a corrupt government, thousands of women organized prayer vigils and nonviolent actions to demand an end to the violence. At the site where the peace talks are stalled, the women barricade the hallway and refuse to leave until the deal is done. After the women persist, the government and the warlords agree to end the civil war. Burma, 2007. As part of a broad pro-democracy movement, thousands of Buddhist monks lead nonviolent marches through the streets of Rangoon. In other cities, monks expand the demonstrations and call for the release of Nobel Peace Laureate Aung San Suu Kyi. Threatened by massive internal opposition and international sanctions, the military dictatorship decides to crack down. On location, 2030. So that's right, you and I can make history by engaging in non-violent means of uh, making conflicts stop. So I'm going to walk you through seven in a very uh, quick uh, way, all taken from the Bible, as to how you and I can prevent war. The first bullet in your notes, and this is the most obvious, personal relationship with God. And this is what the Bible calls peace with God. Man and God are at hostility with each other. God is holy, man is sinful, and uh, man is at war with God. But the Lord Jesus, by his death on the cross, his sacrificial death on the cross, he took the arm of God and took the arm of man and reconciled the two to each other. And that's what we call peace with God. The war is over. The enmity is over. God and I are friends. God and you are friends. Provided we come repentant to the feet of the Lord Jesus and embrace him to be our only Lord and Savior. So the scripture says, Romans 5.1 Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. That's the starting point. And if there is anyone seated here this morning who does not have a personal relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to encourage you to open up your life to this wonderful, amazing Savior, the Lord Jesus, and experience peace with God. Secondly, we need to practice reconciliation. And this is a very tough scripture that is quoted. Romans 12, verses 16 and 18. Live in harmony with each other. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. So you and I must be committed to doing whatever we can, whatever is humanly possible to reach out to the alienated and to become their friends. It's not going to work all the time, but at least we have given it a try. We have given it effort. We have given it time. And it must start in the home. It must extend to the church, the workplace, the community. So practice reconciliation. And beloved, this morning, if you're alienated from someone, it could be a family member, it could be someone in the church, it could be someone in the workplace, it could be a relative, I want to strongly encourage you to take steps of reconciliation. And if you want help in that area, I'm always available, give me a call, we can talk, we can pray, and I can give you some uh, methods, practical ways as to how you can take the first step. In other words, God is calling you and me to be the initiator. Are you listening? God is calling us to be the initiators. And when we initiate, it's amazing what the Spirit of God can do in and through us. Number three, I'm guilty of this, and I know you're guilty. We don't pray for world leaders. If we do pray, we pray selectively. 
So I want to encourage you as a church, more than what we have done before, to mention world leaders by name and to start praying for them. Right? You can't pray for the whole world in one day. But certainly you can pray for one world leader a day. I think all of us need to pray for the North Korean strong man, the hermit kingdom, that, uh, that he would come to know the Lord. And that the walls that separate North Korea from South Korea will come tumbling down like the burning wall. And that the gospel can spread all across North Korea. And people can be healed and reconciled to God and to uh, estranged uh, relatives in another part of the same Korea. So, let me read the scripture. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. What a challenge to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. It starts with prayer for world leaders. Number four, you and I are called to be peacemakers and peacekeepers. Now did you notice, it doesn't say peace lovers. Now you, you might get up this morning and say, I'm a peace lover. And my question to you would be, so what are you doing about it? <coughs> so it's useless to say I'm a peace lover. These are the two critical words. Am I a peacemaker? and a peace maintainer. So Matthew 5, 9, the Lord Jesus said, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. And uh, number five, I think this is, a, this is another critical aspect of peace in the world. Proclaim the gospel, the good news of Christ. The only solution to conflict, to war, to bitterness, to revenge, to hate is the gospel of peace, to proclaim the Prince of Peace. And so Ephesians 6.15 exhorts us for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. We should be ready to proclaim the gospel at a moment's notice. Right? When the opportunity opens itself up, we must jump right in and declare the gospel. You too will be uh, reading this many times in the month of December. What the angel told the shepherds, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Glory to God in highest heaven. Now watch the words and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. So proclaim the gospel of peace to people. And then uh, finally, number six, you and I need to be the preservatives in society. What do we mean by that? You and I are called to be salt and light. You and I are called to be salt and light. And one of the properties of salt is what? To retard decay, to prevent decay. So as you head out into the work world, as you head out of church into a hostile world, you are leaving as the representatives of the Lord Jesus in being salt and light to the world. William Temple, if ever you get his writings, read it. He is an amazing man of God who lived during the Second World War era, Archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, he said something very interesting, and with this I close. We Christians in war are called to the hardest task of all, to fight without hatred, to resist without bitterness, and in the end, if God so grants it, triumph without vindictiveness. I'm going to ask the youth to come and lead us in a closing song. And then I will pronounce the benediction.